Like, we shoot a podcast on a black magic studio camera. We don't need to. <laughs> I don't need to have a video that's recorded at 50 megabits per second for a YouTube output that's going to max out at maybe like 30. I, I think that's what it allowed me to allow me to just kind of experiment with the tech and a little bit more elevated in some ways, but still making sure that the videos themselves, it's still us. It's still us having fun. We're still having that banter, that camaraderie that we've always had since 2015, 2016. If someone asks us, can you react to this thing or can you watch this movie? The first thing we ask ourselves, are we gonna have fun watching this? And if we watch the trailer and we're like, we're not into it, we're not gonna watch it because it's not gonna be an enjoyable experience for the audience. Three, two, one. Welcome back to the Reactiverse Podcast, brought to you by Passion Fruit. I am excited today by today's guest, uh, beyond comprehension to me, honestly. It's a little surreal to be sitting here with this man. Uh, I got into the reaction YouTube online space in around 2017, and this man was one of the first faces and names that I came across. And I've been following his journey since then. Uh, it's been a long road. But we're here today, and it is a treat for me uh, personally. It is Adam Lavic of Heroes Reforged. Adam, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. What an intro. Um, <laughs> I mean, thank yeah, first of all, thank you for inviting me, but also thank you because you have helped us. Um, you've edited some of our videos in the past, and it's been so hugely helpful, and I super, super appreciate it. So I'm excited to be here. This is going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited to just talk and uh you know talk about our experiences and it's been really fun watching some of the other episodes and see you know what other how other reactors how they go about you know the things that that that, that we do so i'm excited to talk about all that stuff of course yeah uh, i mean you know like i said i've been in this space for several years now and uh one of the first names the faces i saw was you and hector both just in various spaces but also together and just that sort of uh, synergy you have between the two of you branching outward into other uh, venues was something that was really uh, exciting to me when i saw that because i just i was like oh there's like this sort of lived in world between people that i i see people occupying and um yeah it was it was just an exciting time to, to get to know people and uh you two were like such big inspirations for me honestly just getting involved in this space Mm -hmm. um and so i want to cover the whole story the whole the whole journey here uh, and everything because i know there's a lot um so as always i'd like to go back to the beginning of everything uh to cover your work from where it all started uh i mean your current podcast that you uh do with your friend hector and augustine is called the Chexicans, which mm -hmm. is a reference to your personal heritage uh being from the czech republic from prague i've seen you express how important that those roots are to you uh could you tell me what is your history there growing up and were you born there? Did you, were you raised there to come to America later in life? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, funnily enough, I'm the first American born in the family. So my family lived there until 1981. Then they came here. They first came to New York. Um, and I, I, I actually found out recently that I have a ton more family that lives in the United States that came here, I think, sometime in the 60s or 70s. But they're mostly in the East Coast or like Minnesota area. But I've never met I've never met that side of my family. They come from my grandparents' side of the family. But my my grandma and my grandfather, my mom's side, and my mom and my aunt came here in 1981, and then I was born not too long after that. And I grew up in San Diego actually for the majority of my life. But I was lucky enough that I grew up in a household where Czech dominated. So mm -hmm. all of the traditions, whether it was the holidays or birthdays and all that sort of stuff, that's kind of how I grew up. And I learned the language also by the time I was two. So I can speak English and I can speak Czech. Nice. Um, so when I go back home and I visit my family, primarily, especially with my grandmother, I speak Czech. And I got a chance to go to school there for a couple of years as well for first grade and second grade. So I really got sort of absorbed into the culture and what it was like. And I got to learn the language in a more professional sort of educated way, which was amazing. I loved it. It was really, really cool. And I got to live in Four Seasons because, you know, in Southern California, unless you're going to the mountains, you don't really get that full experience. Right. So it was amazing to spend Christmas in the snow, go sledding like right outside of our, our apartment that we lived in. 
it was a really, really cool time. And I got to experience, you know, their movie theater going experience as well. They have intermissions. Um, I got to watch some movies in Czech. I got to watch some movies in English, which was really, really cool. <laughs> uh, and also TV was great because some stuff was offered in English, not a lot, but some, but then a lot of it was also in Czech. So I got to really experience the full aspect of like living in a foreign country as a kid. And it was great. I loved it. Um, and then high school and all that stuff I finished out here and I was already at that point into film. Like when I was probably in middle school, elementary school, when I really started getting passionate about movies and mm -hmm. it was all because of star Wars, because of that re-release in 97, which right. I think that's common for a lot of people. My yeah. mom took me to see it. We waited in line for three hours. It was an amazing experience. It was life changing. And after that, I really was like, Oh, this filmmaking thing. Well, first of all, it was visual effects specifically right. that I was like, Oh, this is cool. Like how did they make all these starships and how do they make things fly and explode? And once I got into VHS and the DVD era, then that was like my film school. I watched anything and everything I could to yeah. find out how they made stuff. And so started using Photoshop. I was lucky enough that we had like a family friend who had access to Photoshop and After Effects and Premiere. So by 12, I was dabbling in a lot of those programs and figuring out how to use them, which is kind of the reason why I think I've never switched and gone to Final Cut or DaVinci. I'm such right. an Adobe user. Um, they should be paying me at this point to use their products. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I really just started kind of perfecting, you know, quote unquote, perfecting my craft at a really young age. And then I started without even really realizing I was doing it. I started directing projects, mm -hmm. a lot of small short films and stuff like that. And by the time I was in high school, um, I don't know. I feel like I really fully embraced like movie making mm -hmm. and really started thinking like, oh, this could be a, a career potentially. I really could consider this doing something, you know, for a living. And then I started working at a movie theater when I was in 10th or 11th grade. Mm -hmm. One that completely changed my life socially. I had some of my best friends in my entire life have come from that job. Right. Um, my girlfriend who I'm currently with, you know, we worked together, we went to high school together. So it did mm -hmm. like that movie theater experience really changed my life in ways that I'd never would have expected. Um, so that was also a film school cause I got to see everything for free. Yeah. Right. And <laughs> you know, when you got Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez and, you know, Guillermo del Toro and all these incredible directors making movies and you get to go experience them in the theater. And a lot of times, you know, if it was like a really early show, or really late show, I'd be the only one in there. So I'd be fully immersed in this world. And right. it really taught me a lot about camera work and directing and, you know, writing and all kinds of stuff. Um, but I was still working on visual effects in the background. Mm -hmm. right. And I, that was something that I was really passionate about. And at a certain point, while I was working at the theater, and at that point, I had transitioned, I was mostly working in the projection booth. So I was building 35 millimeter prints, tearing them down, running them, all that sort of stuff. I thought, you know what? I really need to find a VFX job because I was so right. passionate about it. Yeah. Funny enough, I looked on Craigslist and there was a listing see, uh, that said, seeking visual effects artist, after effects experience is great, not necessary. And I thought <laughs> to work on Hollywood movies. Right. And I'm like, this has to be a sham <laughs> in San Diego. Hollywood movies is cannot be a real thing, right? It ended up being a real thing. And, um, I think I, I went to go do like a little test to make sure that I could do what they were asking me to do. Mm -hmm. And within three hours, I got a phone call asking if I could start on Monday, which was amazing. Yeah. Um, the job was to do 3d film conversion. So at that point, you know, film conversion became a hot thing because avatar had just come out in 2009 right, and right. by 2010 everyone wanted their movies converted to 3d or shot in 3d so lucky i was lucky enough that i got to go and i got to work on stuff like transformers i worked on the restoration uh for top gun i got to do uh priest and green hornet and like so many movies the smurfs all kinds of stuff and that was where i met augustine we ended up being on the same team together Pretty much immediately, people started confusing us. They started to wonder, like, are you the same person? You, you look a little different today. Like, what? what is this? Right. And eventually, people started thinking, we started telling people that we're cousins. We just yeah. were like, let's just run with it. 
screw it. Who cares? We'll have fun with it. <laughs> and at that point, he had already known Hector for years. They went to art school together. Mm-hmm. So we just became really friendly. Our teams, our groups would hang out together. As it is common practice in Hollywood, there are layoffs that happen and or for us, we got reduced hours. And that was kind of a killer for us because we were so stoked to be working on all this stuff. Transformers, Dark of the Moon. So we started looking at other options and there was a studio in Burbank, Stereo D, that needed people. So mm-hmm. like a mass exodus, <laughs> a bunch of people went over there yeah. and including Augustine and I. So it just really kind of continued that friendship and we continued building our our, our relationship together, our working relationship and we would go to lunch together and we started talking about superhero stuff because mm-hmm. we ended up working on a ton of Marvel projects while at Stereo right. D. Pretty much everything from Thor 1 all the way through. I mean, they're still working on stuff now, but one of my last projects there was Ant-Man, the first Ant-Man. Right, so right. we were working on a ton of Marvel stuff. And at that point, I feel like the the sort of movie discussion space on YouTube was kind of blowing up. Mm-hmm. It started to become a real thing. You know, AMC Movie Talk was a big thing. Uh, Schmoes No was a really big, started to become a really big thing at that point. Oh. So I started really watching that stuff and getting kind of inspired. And I thought, well, here's the thing. We love super, like I love superheroes and I love science fiction, fantasy and all that stuff. But it keeps getting clumped together into the conversation with every other movie, mm-hmm. which is fine. But I feel like it's big enough or it's gotten big enough. You know, at that point, we had already had the Avengers come out and we were like in the middle of phase two. And I thought there's got to be an opportunity to grow this space and to do something unique and different that is just focused on that. Yeah. So I pitched the idea to Augustine and he was like, that sounds really great. But if we do it, we got to ask Hector to be involved. Now, at that point, I had met Hector twice <laughs> and I had interacted with him maybe once fully at a house party that he had. Because we all lived in San Diego uh, at that at that point. Mm-hmm. So I knew him kind of. And I was like, okay, well, let's go to lunch. Let's talk about it. I also wanted to see if I would vibe with Hector on that sort of a level. So we went and we we, t- we talked it out. And I was like, here's my idea. We would do a YouTube show where we just talk about you know superhero movie news. And we can sort of give our input and our theories and predictions on what we think would work and all that sort of stuff. At the same time. We also had to be very careful and conscious of the fact that we were working on Marvel movies at the time, and we obviously could not break any NDAs and talk about anything. So we were like, okay, we can do this, (laughs) and because it's pre-recorded, if anyone slips, it's fine. We can cut it out. I don't think in the two, three years that we did stuff while working on Marvel movies did we ever have a slip, so it was a non-issue. Yeah. And then we just started kind of working at it, and up to that point, I was super camera shy. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't like being on camera. I didn't like doing presentations in front of people. I think Augustine felt the same way. I think Hector was probably at that point the most comfortable because he was doing improv and stand up and all that stuff. So he had kind of built that sort of comfort with an audience, whether they were behind a camera or not. Right. So it took, a, it took a little bit before we got things going, but yeah, then it just kind of went from there and exploded into where we are today. And we're almost coming up on, I think nine, 10 years of doing it together, which is absolutely insane yeah. <laughs> and uh it's it's been fun it's had its ups and downs all over the place but it's been a really good time yeah uh i mean yeah that's a, that's the whole the brunt of it i mean but the really the interesting part to me is that uh you were essentially self-taught when you got into uh editing of vfx and that was just a absolutely. passion that you had and you followed it through that and i had the same journey where like i went through a high school uh, era where I learned editing and then I was super into it and it just, it just clicked for me. And mm-hmm. so that, you know, uh, inspired, inspired me to go through it with, uh, through college and stuff like that. And then uh, eventually get work out here in, uh, in the same area of Burbank and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, uh, when you started doing the VFX stuff, did that, uh, influence you at all in terms of how you approached your sort of, uh, film discourse, you know, when you started thinking about doing it creatively for the channel and so on, uh, like because of the fact that you had production knowledge, not just specifics of the projects you were working on, but just how films are made in general, did that sort of influence how you decided to uh, share your thoughts and opinions? Yeah, totally. It absolutely did. I think the the beautiful thing about it was I got to learn because I embraced, and I know I'm not the only one. I know there are a lot of people that were like me who embraced, you know, special features and behind the scenes of how they made stuff. By the age of 16 and being able to understand and differentiate what VistaVision was versus Technorama versus IMAX versus, you know, all that sort of stuff. 
and understanding like, okay, what is it? How did they do a composite back then versus how they do it now? Oh, it's an optical composite. What does that mean? Right. Um, it really did help me have conversations at a different level with people. And even when I started working for VFX companies, because I, I feel like a lot of times people learn the technical elements of how VFX works. You know, you learn how to do a composite and you understand how a no tree works and you understand that if you plug in, you know, these elements together a certain way, you'll get a final output, but maybe not so much understanding all of the verbiage behind it of like, well, what does this do? What is an alpha mat? What is a luma mat? How does that affect your image? So I think just understanding those elements definitely did give me a little bit of a leg up with people um, when we, when it came to talking about films, because especially with, with visual effects, right? It's one of the most scrutinized things mm -hmm. in entertainment right yeah. now, even like more so now than ever, I would say. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And I felt like just being able to understanding the lingo and understanding a little bit of the process. Now, obviously the process, even in the last eight years, nine years has changed dramatically, especially with the addition of stuff like stagecraft. But I still, to this day, read up and try to stay informed on, you know, the processes of how stuff works. So if I do come into contact with someone, I at least have somewhat of an understanding of what's happening on screen and how effects are made. So I can have something valuable to add to the conversation. And I, and I, I don't think that, and I understand why regular people don't do that sort of stuff because they, one, they don't need to. And, and two, I just don't feel like they, they feel like they need, have the responsibility to do that. Right. But, you know, with something like Mad Max Furiosa, a lot of conversations of, well, this looks fake. This looks CG. And I'm like, yeah, but what, what, what specifically? And yeah. then I can kind of break it down for you and help you maybe understand like what exactly is happening. So I definitely think that understanding sort of the lingo and the verbiage in the world and how the post-production process works has definitely been immensely helpful, not just in having conversations online, but also in like our process of how we record videos, right. you know, totally. uh, we did everything live together in the same room and now we're doing everything remotely and how has my experience and how have the things that I've learned affected that. And I don't right. think, if I didn't understand visual effects and I didn't understand a pipeline, a production pipeline, mm -hmm. I don't think I would have ever been able to figure out how to do stuff remotely right. other than, you know, having these tools available online. Um, but being sense. able to do it from scratch, even two years ago, well, maybe three, four years ago, I wouldn't know. But now knowing that those tools exist, I can figure out, okay, here's how I need to route everything for it to work for us. Totally. Um, well, do you remember your first uh, exposure to YouTube, like when you first like discovered it and then how you sort of like developed an interest in possibly pursuing uh, some sort of career or passion on it? That's a great question. I don't remember, but I know it was in the early days, like 2005, probably not too long after it had launched, truthfully, because up until that point, you know, E-bombs world and that kind of stuff was super, <laughs> yeah. super popular. And then this YouTube thing came along. Um, so I don't even remember what was like the first thing, but I know that my friends and I back in the day when we would go out and do little trips, you know, we would go on weekend trip or we would go to like Disneyland or whatever. Mm -hmm. We would film a ton of videos on our phones and our, and our, um, point and shoot cameras back then. Yeah. And you know, it, you, you didn't really want to figure out how to find the time to transfer that stuff to people. Yeah. So we would just upload to YouTube. Like I ah, just put it on YouTube, just put it on, we can watch it. So we would just, you know, make it private or whatever. And we would be able to watch it all the time. Right. There's probably videos on YouTube of my friends and I just horsing around, <laughs> um, you know, doing, doing whatever, running around the park or I don't know. Um, and then I think the, when I started kind of taking YouTube a little bit more quote unquote seriously was I got into making fan trailers so I started making right. fan trailers 2004, 2005, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I had an old channel. Unfortunately, it's not it's gone now because of copyright stuff. But right. I was making fan trailers for like Batman Begins, Superman Returns, like a ton of stuff back then. And they 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 were getting really, really good views. Um, at one point, I did a Superman Returns like teaser trailer that was obviously fan made. And it was passed off as the real thing for months until yeah. the actual real trailer came out. And I, you know, I was like, well, yeah, it's not real, but thanks. <laughs> um, so that, that was really like my first sort of foray into uploading YouTube videos for people to actually like enjoy in a pretty big sort of, you know, for a pretty big audience. Yeah. And then probably once I started discovering things like Freddie W quarter digital, that's when I was like, okay, this is like, 
this is a potential career thing that right, that right. um then started sparking of like, well, how do I take the things that I know about filmmaking, visual effects, and the little things I know about YouTube as a distribution platform, and how do I make those things all work together? It took mm -hmm. some time, but eventually I, I got there. All right. Uh, yeah, I had the same sort of, again, journey uh, getting into YouTube. I made anime music videos. <laughs> that was mm. like my sort of uh, uh, exercise, just learning how to edit and sort of like play around with things at that time. And I definitely saw, I think in that era, those... Uh, old fan trailers i may, may possibly saw one of yours that you might have put out i would watch those all the time as well yeah. um and then uh yeah you said turning this into sort of a career and uh, a way to uh build a sort of platform for yourself uh your first foray into it as far as like the sort of pundit space was for superhero news mm -hmm. um once you got there uh, with hector and augustine you guys kind of like yeah really took off like very quickly just sort of establishing yourselves and your faces and your names as part of like you said this sort of superhero comic book space that was in its heyday of like you know phase two marvel mm -hmm. and so on uh when you guys got there uh did you have any sort of specific awareness of like the reaction space and like you said i know you know uh, the most knows stuff like that were there any other sort of channels you were inspired by well, I would say Schmoes Knows and AMC Movie Talk were probably the two primary ones. Mm -hmm. I watched that because I think AMC Movie Talk did a show every day at at, at one point, right. maybe every day. I think it was every day, and so I'd watch the live the live stream. I think every morning, and then I'd watch Christian and Mark show every week like clockwork. Um, so that was like a surreal experience. Eventually, like they asked me to come on the show, and I was like, "Whoa, what the hell? That was insane." So yeah, those I think those were the the two main things in terms of movie discussion that uh, I think kind of sort of inspired the idea of like, "Oh, we could do this." Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, superhero news was 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 an interesting thing because the name obviously was massively helpful because it's so it's so generic, but it's so discoverable yes yeah true and i think up to that point i think that's the thing that really got people to the channel was just typing into youtube superhero news and it was mm -hmm. one of the first things that would come up right and i think we had a massive advantage kind of like how christian mark did that they had been friends for a while and we were mm -hmm. friends for a while at that point like a few years and even though i didn't know hector as well augustine knew hector really well so it really balanced itself out where Augustine, I guess, in some ways became a middleman, which at the time I didn't even realize where he could really kind of like bring the conversation together because he knew Hector and he knew me. Right. And then, you know, after about a year, maybe even less than that, maybe six months, it was really like we really understood each other's rhythm and it really helped us. And I think that's what people latched on to. Yeah. Yes, they loved the stuff that we talked about and they liked the – the insights and the theories that we maybe would have and we would use our comic book knowledge and our knowledge of working on movies to then try to sort of reverse engineer okay well the comic book does this but how do we reverse engineer that to work in a movie right and i think people appreciated that it was a little bit more of a realistic approach and not just well just do the comic book or <laughs> just make it big and crazy and you know massive scale and all that sort of stuff we would be like okay well okay they're making a movie Two hundred million dollars, hundred million dollars. How do you realistically do that? Yeah. So I think people, I think people appreciated that we had a little bit more of like a realistic take on it, mm -hmm. and you know we would just be buffoons on camera sometimes, <laughs> but we had fun. We had a lot yeah. of fun doing it. Um, and I think the the thing that really helped motivate us was the year that we started. I said, I think we started in January, and mm -hmm. I said our goal is to get to ten thousand subscribers by Comic Con. That should be our goal. Right. Six, seven months to, to do that. They were a little bit skeptical about it. They were like, I don't know. It seems like a huge number. It seems like it's impossible to do. And I said, look, if we just stick to it every single week, we show up and we talk about news and, you know, and we, and we just are consistent with it, we can do it. When it comes to reactions, I think the earliest reaction I had seen, there were maybe like six trailer reactions for Man of Steel. Mm -hmm. And that was back in 2013. Right. So I was aware that people made trailer reactions. I just didn't really know. At that point, I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Like, are people, do people really care to watch these things? Mm -hmm. But then the more I got exposed to them, the more I was like, this is actually kind of fun to watch someone react to a movie that I'm excited about and to get their sort of insight into it. Mm -hmm. But the thing was, is not a lot of people were giving insight. They were just reacting 
And they would say, like, that was a cool trailer. All right, guys, subscribe and uh, come back next week for the new video. And I was like, but let's have a discussion about it. Yeah. So my pitch to them was, like, well, if we do trailer reactions, maybe we could help bring in the audience because people will be searching for that. But the thing that we'll do differently is we'll add commentary and we'll add our opinions and we'll bring our comic book knowledge and our movie making knowledge into the process. And let's try to theorize and see where things could go. So I think that also really helped set us apart from everybody else was we weren't just saying that looks really cool. We would say that looks really cool and we can't wait for what this could potentially lead to. So I think that was extremely helpful uh, in, in bringing viewers in. Yeah, and uh, and you guys had that so naturally uh, too between the three of you because uh, even though you said you had only known Hector and Augustine for a handful of years by that point, uh, I think quite very quickly the uh, massive appeal that you three had was just the fact that you felt like lifelong friends, mm-hmm. like very very quickly, and totally. uh, I think that resonated on screen uh, and every other sort of. Uh, uh, avenue that you had followed um and at that time you were branching out very quickly within the course of like a couple of years at that point you had uh you were doing uh Kachess and stan on geek and sundry you were uh, branching over to hyper rpg it was a lot of uh stuff i know that you were working on at that time uh do you recall that workload in that first couple of years just trying to stay on top of everything that you were doing oh my god well i would <laughs> say from from the moment that we started superhero news probably until 2020 I would sleep an average of three hours a night yep. and it was just cranking out videos and it yeah. was just like, what can we make a video about? What movie can we review? What trailer can we react to? What TV spot can we react to? So, and thir- uh, back when we were doing superhero news, I think Thursday night was our filming night, our mm-hmm. dedicated filming night to when we would do our news, our news show. Trailer reactions, we would just, you know, if we, if a trailer came out on Tuesday, Everybody would come over to my place on Tuesday night and we would record and I would just, you know, get, and it's so funny because back then everything was so much slower. Not true. Yeah. You know, processing videos was slower. Getting mm-hmm. the edit done was slower. Uploading it was slower. Making a thumbnail was slower. It was just like, oh my God. So I'd be up <laughs> till three in the morning sometimes working on trailer reactions or whatever. And yeah, at a certain point it starts to affect your, your like regular day. Mm -hmm. day job too i remember i'd have moments where i would like start dozing off at work and i'm like oh my god if i don't make my quota they're gonna fire me (laughs) so that was that became stressful but and yeah then we took on concession stand and that was on mondays and that was a three-hour commitment on camera but it was also like a two-hour three-hour prep to get that show ready with assets and figuring out what trailers we were going to watch during the show and you have to have energy you got to be on and I remember the concept of going to Geek and Sundry and doing a live show. That was absolutely mortifying because mm-hmm. we had only been doing superhero news for maybe, I don't even know, four, five months or something. Right. If that, and there was a Twitch streamer who was supposed to have a show there on that day, and then he ended up not showing up. So Hector had already been working with some of the people there who were running it for a couple months. And, and so I don't know if he had pitched the idea or if they had asked him like, hey, do you guys want to do your show live? So I thought, all right, we'll go do it live. Um, so we did it. It was more like a guest appearance. And then the person who had their show on there ended up like never coming back to do their show. So he was, right. they were just like, well, do you guys just want to do it here full time? Yeah. And, you know, I was like, well, we're doing a thing on YouTube. Like how, how is this going to work if we go to Twitch, a different platform? So then we built, we built it out to be a totally different show, which mm-hmm. was a good idea to do. Um, but yeah, so it was just like, that was the norm was Monday going to the, you know, geek and sundry studio Thursday, coming to my house to film stuff in the middle of that, we'd be filming trailer reactions. So, you know, it was, it, it did quickly become a six day part-time job, you know, after 5 PM or after seven, well, actually even later than that, because when we were doing visual effects, we were working 10 hour days pretty consistently for six days a week. Right. So we'd be working till seven and then they come over and we'd be doing that till 10. And then I'd be editing till two or three in the morning, sometimes later. So it was just like this vicious cycle that became the norm for me. And I definitely think it, I don't think I felt the full effects of it until maybe a year later, mm-hmm. year and a half later, where I st- started to feel like, okay, this is getting insane, but it never slowed down because yeah. the movies never slowed down. <laughs> right. And then they started incorporating, you know, shows into it like Marvel Daredevil, like the Netflix Daredevil and Defender mm-hmm. stuff. So it just kind of kept piling on and piling on and piling on. Right. And you know, it just 
it is how it is. Uh, <laughs> things have slowed down a little bit, I feel like, but not really, because yeah. now video game shows are are exploding, you know, Fallout, True. The Last of Us, all that sort of stuff. So <laughs> it just kind of evolves. It doesn't really get better. It just evolves. Yeah, uh, I share that. I share that uh, same experience, you know, working for the Smowdown uh, for yeah. a few years and as well as the reaction space, as well as a full time job for a handful of years. So there's a time where I was sleeping a couple hours a day and then going to my job, working at my job <laughs> on other stuff. And then uh, it was a night job, too. So I would wake up, at, you know, I would go to bed at like five in the morning sleep until like by 8 a.m 9 a.m get back up do my day of other stuff then go back into it <laughs> i was yeah. definitely on a, a very similar grind for uh for a handful of years mm-hmm. um but then yeah d- balancing the work with uh sort of the the stuff that you were doing for superhero news you eventually uh, transitioned over to hyper rpg mm-hmm. and uh, the way you kind of described it was just a reflection of that work that you were putting the the amount of stuff you were contributing to the, the channel and to the various things that you had going on at the time and seeing that there was an opportunity at hyper RPG to kind of help you with the sort of infrastructure that would uh, accommodate that sort of workload. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you remember at that time working with such a large group of names of people and the resources from hyper RPG and uh, finding the balance between work and fun, you know, between like just everything that you were doing? Totally. Yeah. Well, the great thing about transitioning over to hyper was they had a crew. So I didn't really have to worry about too much of the tech stuff anymore. We could go and just set up the living room and we would have help to you know do all that stuff. So then it kind of became, okay, now it's just about getting out as much stuff as possible and not necessarily worrying about, oh, is the microphone plugged in? Which was great. I loved okay. that. It made okay. things in some ways a lot easier. Um, so it was great. And at the time when I was doing that, I was still working a full-time job. I was working at... Green junkies at that point Mm -hmm. i was doing a lot of so i ended up the company that i was working for the vfx company that was doing the marvel movies they ended up announcing that they're going to move to canada and i was like well i'm doing a youtube thing here and it's going well so i'm not going to canada yeah so then i went to go work for screen junkies for a few years which is crazy that's already six seven years ago holy moly it's crazy how fast time (laughs) time goes by yeah um so i was doing i was doing that during the day and then i'd come home and we'd record stuff in the evening so it definitely helped having some kind of an infrastructure that could help kind of support us and then we went to comic-con it was also really helpful because again i would have people who could help me set up the gear and i didn't really Mm -hmm. have to worry about too much i could go do coverage on the floor and then i could somebody else would edit and upload the trailers and do the thumbnails and stuff which was amazing um so yeah it was in that regard it was really really cool and it was nice because hyper because they were also doing Twitch content, they would have a lot of people come through and they would do a lot of different shows Monday through Friday, sometimes on Saturdays too. So people were constantly in and out of the house like all the time. But it was great because when you're doing the stuff that we do, and I know you know this, you don't get to have much of a social life. Right. So being exposed to people and being able to have conversations with people and still build relationships, even though you're never leaving the house because you're constantly working – was really nice and it was really great and I loved it for that. It was a really fun like community house in a lot of ways because people would come in all the time and they would come hang out at the pool and we would have like little get togethers and barbecues and parties and stuff. Uh, and it was really, really fun. There was like no, whenever people were over, there was never, cause you know, sometimes you hear about like hype house and there's drama and this That's stuff. Right. We never had that. It was a lot of fun. We just had a really good time and we would experiment with videos and we would experiment to see like, would this work? Would that work? Can we maybe embrace a different genre of stuff that we're covering? We experimented with another concession stand type of a show that was called Mm -hmm. Cineverse. So I just really got to be creative and I just got to explore doing very different unique things. So for that, it was, it was really cool because we could do it because we had enough people who could help kind of support that. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, for me, it was really it's hyper RPG and uh, the Schmodan that sort of opened my eyes to like the expansive, you know, cinematic universe of this whole space. It was mm-hmm. seeing you on that and Schmodan, and as well as Emma and like you know a bunch of other people who were just kind of crossing over mm-hmm. to different channels, stuff like that, and was seeing like, oh, this is the, this is the whole ecosystem of people that really do work together really mm-hmm. well, and that was something that really uh, was tantalizing to me just seeing yeah. that sort of uh, uh experience totally. um and th- you were at the forefront of so much of it you were working so, uh just, I don't, just going i'm doing my research for this i looked through like you know all the hyper rpg videos everything just seeing your face on so many of the thumbnails of 
different things with different people, yeah. different shows, different titles, everything. Um, and that carried you over for, <clears throat> I think, several years, uh, going all the way from 2017, I think, was when you started going into 2020 and mm -hmm. that early era of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, was there a uh, significant pivot uh, or learning curve for you getting into the remote reactions uh, for the pandemic? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, and first of all, you know, I think the thing, I think the reason like why I ended up kind of being in everything in a lot of ways was because I understood the tech aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And because I had been editing those videos for so long, you and I know you know this for sure, you start to understand the rhythm of the video. You start to understand mm -hmm. what needs to be in the video and what needs to come out of the video. And you know how to sort of drive the conversation. Because I've, I've done the intros and the outros for every video that we've done, I would say 99.9% .9 of the videos that we've done for mm -hmm. eight, nine years. So I understand the flow and I understand the rhythm and I know how to kind of like get us into a video and get us out of a video. And it's kind of, it sounds dumb, but knowing that is so valuable. And someone like Hector, who is a totally capable, extremely talented, much better host than I am, if he has to do the intro and the outro, he forgets to mention things because he's not used to it. Like right. I know, okay, I'm going to do the intro. I'm going to tell people what we're watching. I'm going to remind them to subscribe. I'm going to remind them to go to our Discord. I'm going to remind them to leave a comment. I'm gonna... But like a lot of people who don't do that every single week on a continual basis, they're not going to remember to to do all that stuff. Yeah. So I think that's part of the reason why I also end up being in a lot of the videos was I understood what it took to cut them down and to make them fun mm -hmm. and to make them fun to watch. But also because like I honestly just knew how to intro and outro them well because I had already been doing it for so long. Right. So when it came to the pandemic, that was an interesting situation because we had never, ever, ever done anything remotely as far as I remember. I don't think there ever was a point where we did anything remotely. So it was like, oh my God, we can't get into a room and we can't film anything, which in some ways was advantageous to us because nothing was coming out anyway. Right. But I think the thing that we missed out on was that we didn't get to take advantage of everybody being at home. So I think where there was an opportunity to maybe do remote content, remote videos where we could rewatch old things. We could revisit the entire MCU. We could revisit the entire DC universe. We could revisit all of star Wars, every animated show, every movie, every TV show. That's something that we kind of missed out on, which is a bummer. And I think it did hurt us a little bit, but in that meantime, because hyper was experimenting with doing remote stuff and we were experimenting with bringing people in to do remote calls. We tried zoom, hated it. Didn't like the right. quality. Didn't like how sort of unreliable and unpredictable it was. So it was like, what, what, there's gotta be a piece of software out there that can help. And then we, then we discovered vMix and it was like, wow, it can do remote calls. It can do up to four megabits per second for remote callers. We can do graphics that are P like, you know, they're, they're on transparency so we can fly graphics in. So it really started to become, um, a tool that I was like, okay, well then we should be able to do remote calls to do reactions. If we just pull up a separate window to watch stuff. And then I can take all that footage, compile it, um, and then, you know, create a video out of it. So it was a little bit of a learning curve because we had been doing Zoom for a while and I was taking all that material and like compiling everything completely raw. But with vMix, I, I realized, oh, I can just input everybody into a window in a gra over and overlay it with a graphic. Right. And then I can just take that element and then just edit on top of that. Once we figured that part out, like once I knew I could do that and I felt confident about it, and I had the internet capability to do it. It was like, okay, the you know, there's no limit to what we can do. We can do literally anything. Right. So being able to jump into that remote setting was a huge game changer for us. And it it's the only way that we would have been able to even do Heroes Reforged. It would have mm -hmm. not been a possibility. I mean, it would have been a possibility, but we would have had to have waited till you know 2021, 2022 to do it. And being able to figure out how to do it remotely. It was a game changer and we could jump into something like the Mandalorian that was hugely popular. Mm -hmm. And within days we had, I think within four days we had 10,000 subscribers yeah. and it just kept going um, pretty quickly from there. So yeah, pandemic was like a, obviously it was a horrible experience for us in terms of like making a new channel. It was sort of a blessing and a curse because mm -hmm. we got to learn a whole new tool set and a whole new, um, 
way of recording stuff. So yeah. it was interesting. Yeah, yeah. Because at the end of uh, 2020 is when you announced Heroes Reforged and you're moving yeah. over to that channel. Um, was that something that you sort of spearheaded, or was that sort of a mutual decision between you, Augustine, and Hector? Uh, it was. It was. It was a mutual decision. Yeah, because mm-hmm. we had when we were at Hyper. I think the thing that became challenging for us was it was our heroes, Hyper Heroes content that was getting mixed in with you know a lot of the stuff that they were porting over from Twitch to YouTube. It was a lot of RPGs and all that sort of stuff. And audio, which I now today I understand, you know, why the audience was not necessarily super fond of that. They just, some of the people who knew us from YouTube and had subscribed to that channel, they just wanted to see us. Mm -hmm. And we were uploading sometimes 10 videos a week because it would be five RPGs, three trailer reactions. It would be our podcast or our show or whatever we were doing at that point. So I think it over flooded people's subscription boxes. And at that point, I think our traction had started to die down a little bit and people were not seeing our stuff as much. So we started talking and we were, and so we started having conversation of maybe we need to make just like our own channel. That is its own thing that it's just us. It's just our videos and it's just the stuff that our audience wants to watch. Reactions, reviews, discussion pieces on the stuff that we had been doing prior to being at Hyper. Mm-hmm. So it was I, – I think it really took one conversation for everybody to be like, yeah, we should we should absolutely do that. Mm-hmm. So I don't think there was really any convincing. I think the thing that was – the convincing part was, well, can we do that? Do we actually have the infrastructure to do that? Is that possible? What do we mm-hmm. need in order to do that? So right. there were some, definitely some growing pains. You know, I, I had an older computer that I was using and it just could not keep up with the processing. So yeah. that was like, okay, <laughs> cool. Our first videos, our first videos worked fairly well, but very quickly I realized, okay, I need a new computer. And as yeah. you know, in 2020, it was almost impossible to get a new computer because right. processors, graphics cards, they were just unavailable because everyone was upgrading their computer systems at that point. Yeah, true. So it took a while, but eventually, finally, we got it working. And and from there on out, you know, WandaVision was a huge hit for us. Loki was a huge hit for us. Falcon and Winter Soldier, pretty much everything from phase four because everyone had been waiting for the moment that Marvel was going to make a comeback. Even Invincible did really well for us. Mandalorian obviously did well for us. And so it really helped that the the space was kind of dry when it came to new stuff Mm -hmm. and that we were kind of there the moment it came back. Right. Uh, It really, really, really helped. And that was part of the discussion, too, was we got to take advantage of all the new stuff coming out if if we're going to do this. Like we got to we got to start with the Mandalorian season, two, And it did pay off immensely. Yeah. Um, and like you mentioned, you know, going from say superhero news to hyper RPG to, to this now it, you know, you weren't a stranger to handling a large creative output, but this mm-hmm. was a bit different because this would be yours entirely. Mm-hmm. It would be your brand, your name, your work, everything from top to bottom. Yeah. Uh, was there any sort of trepidation you had going into that? Just knowing that everything is finally just, it's on like, you know, it's like, everything is just your guys, your name. Yeah, there was for sure. And you know, it's part of the reason why when we launched, we didn't launch a Patreon because I thought I don't want to I don't want to deal with that cuz you know, dealing with dealing with YouTube monetization is fairly easy. You put the stuff on there, the ads, you know, generate some sort of a revenue and then at the end on the 22nd of every month they spit out a value right. to you. Great, cool. But with Patreon, it's a whole new ball game because you have to figure out what additional things are we going to give people? Is that going to be valuable to them? And then what do we charge them for it? Like I had no clue up to that point, like what to charge. And I also just didn't really want to charge the audience for, for anything. I liked that our YouTube content was kind of free, but the YouTube audience kept asking for it. They were like, make a Patreon, put your uncut reactions on there. I'd love to watch the whole thing with you. And I was like, okay, (laughs) sure. I I don't know how long after we launched the channel we did. I want to say maybe like two, three, maybe like three months later, I think. Wasn't too long, yeah. We did it. And I want to say that in the first week, we had like 2,000 patrons, which was shocking to me. I was (laughs) like, what the hell? Okay. (laughs) So all of a sudden it was like, oh, we can build a whole new revenue stream. Oh, this can allow us to like make more videos. This can allow us to buy, you know, some gear. So I started to feel a little bit of like a freedom in some ways that I could be a little bit more experimental with like, okay, I can push, I can push the way that we we record stuff, 
because I, I can now afford to buy a nicer camera, a nicer cable, a nicer video processor, a nicer this, a nicer that. So that was, that was, it was a little bit, it was actually kind of freeing in a lot of ways. And I'm, I am that type of person that I, which is sometimes a, a blessing and a curse all in, in and of itself. But, um, I like to present our videos in the highest quality possible. Like mm-hmm. I really like doing that. Yeah. So I was like, and at the time we weren't doing, you know, like 4k uploads or anything, but I was like, I want everything to look good. I want everyone to come watch a video and it's a very pleasurable experience. We sound good. It looks good. The thing that we're reacting to, it's really nice quality. It's not, you know, it's not looking all pixelated and all that sort of stuff. And that's carried on till this day. And, you know, like we shoot a podcast on a black magic studio camera. We don't need to. <laughs> I don't need to have a video that's recorded at 50 megabits per second for a YouTube output that's going to max out at maybe like 30. Yeah. But I'm like, well, whatever. I have the camera, so I might as well do it. <laughs> so I, I think that's what it allowed me to allow me to just kind of experiment with the tech and figure out ways of doing things that's just different and a little bit, a little bit more elevated in some ways, but still making sure that the videos themselves, it's still us. It's still us having fun. We're still having that banter, that camaraderie that we've always had since 2015, 2016. Um, so that to me is always, that's always been like the most important thing. It has to be fun. We won't do it if it's not fun. Even now, if someone asks us, can you react to this thing or can you watch this movie? The first thing we ask ourselves, are we going to have fun watching this? And if we watch the trailer and we're like, we're not into it, we're not going to watch it because it's not going to be an enjoyable experience for the audience. Right, right. So, yeah. And like you, like you said, the camaraderie between the three of you is like such an important aspect. Um, yeah. And the biggest hindrance, it seemed, from many of your years working in the space was the fact that you, Hector and Augustine, don't live together and you have yeah. a very busy life. So, like, scheduling around that stuff is like such a, a huge obstacle to get around. Oh, um, my God. Such and so a do huge you, obstacle. Yeah. And, do you think uh, this, this, uh, the start of the pandemic, uh, was that helpful at all in terms of just like, okay, now we have the tools and the means to like do more stuff like on the fly because we don't have to leave our homes to to get this stuff done. Absolutely. And it's funny because the audience, you know, like let's say a trailer would come out and we'd be – a trailer would come out and it'd be 7 o'clock at night and we all lived in completely opposite directions of each other. Mm-hmm. And so I was like – do you really want to come over now? It's going to take you an hour to get here. It's going to take us, you know, 40 minutes to record. By the time I get to editing this video, it's going to be like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And, you know, sometimes we say like, no, we'll just do it tomorrow. We'll just do it the next day. Or there'd be days where we literally be recording. They would leave and 10 minutes later, the trailer would drop. And it's like, well, I'm already halfway home, you know, so right. just like that was so frustrating. And the, and the audience and I get it. They're excited. They're enthusiastic. They sometimes don't get that. They don't understand that we don't live next door. We don't live down the block. We live like Los Angeles is huge. Right. One, two, there's traffic all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes the audience doesn't understand that. They don't realize that. Yeah. And so they're like, well, you're just recording it. Like what's so hard about that? It's like, it's not, it's not just the recording. It's the time to get there. It's the time to get home right. that just eats up all your, all your free time. And you know, everyone has a significant other, whether it's, whether they're married or just dating, it doesn't matter. You have to also allocate spending time with them. You can't mm-hmm. just Sorry, I I got to cancel plans. Sorry, I got to, you know, change plans. Sorry, I got to go, you know. You you have to also be respectful of people's personal time. Right. So, it's always been a balance. Now, thankfully, it's much easier. We still have to be very conscious of each other's schedules. And if somebody has plans with a significant other or whatever, being able to do it remotely is much easier and it's much faster. You literally just turn everything on, you record, you can be in and out in 30 minutes at most right. if you need it to be. So it has definitely allowed us to to um, have a more flexible schedule. And honestly, like the fact that we were driving to each other's houses to do trailers, to do like a 10-minute video on a trailer, to spend an hour in traffic is insane. <laughs> so now we love the fact that we can pop on and do a trailer reaction and be in and out 30 minutes and it's – done and then they can go about their day right um the only thing that i would say now we dedicate time towards being in the same room together is our podcast Mm because i just think it has a different totally different flow and vibe when we're in the same room right and sometimes we'll do uh movie watch alongs because we like to watch some of them in 3d and and i have a 3d tv (laughs) um so we can do them all together 
Um, and then sometimes we just feel like doing a random episode of a show or we'll be, you know, mashing that up with a recording of a podcast. So we'll do a podcast episode and then we'll watch three episodes of, you know, the last of us or something. Right. So it just depends on how it kind of works out. But I, I truthfully, like I prefer us being in the same room for yeah. those big recordings, the podcasts, even the movies. Like, I really love that. The trailers, it's fine. The trailers are totally fine to do like, you know, separately remotely. It's totally fine. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the Chexicans podcast is what you're referring to. It's a, yeah. such a, a great uh, podcast. I think that is really in the vein of like what you were doing for several years at concession totally. stands and for Cineverse, which is just mm. talking about the industry at large and you know, what your sort of insight and experience is with it. Um, I think the most important aspect of you and Augustine and Hector is that experience. The fact mm. that you guys have knowledge of the film industry that you're able to provide for uh, viewers who aren't privy to that. I think it set you apart uh, very much so from a lot of other channels. Uh, and I think that played heavily into, you know, what we just recently got out of, which was the WGA and SAG strikes of mm -hmm. uh, 2023. Yeah. And um, do you remember uh, when you guys, when that hit, when those were coming, you know, around the bend, uh, the discussion between the three of you going into like, okay, what are we going to do for this? Because I know you guys ended up going on a small, a small hiatus uh, for some mm -hmm. of your content uh, in solidarity with the strikes. Right. Yeah. Well, one of the last things that we shot that was not like a trailer reaction or anything, we did a cooking special back in May and it's actually going to come out on Tuesday, but yeah. And at that point it was the writer strike and there, there were rumblings that there was potentially going to be an actor strike, but we didn't know for sure. So we did kind of start having the conversation fairly early on of, okay, but what, what do we do? Do we, do we just stop? Cause it's, it's a tough decision because you know, this is a lot of people's livelihood and we're not necessarily directly connected to SAG. None of us are in SAG. None of us are obviously in the Writers Guild either. But we have a lot of friends and coworkers and, and you know, um, and people that we know. I was trying to think. I was going to say accomplices, not accomplices. What's the word I'm thinking of? Acquaintances. Acquaintances. Jesus. <laughs> English. It's my first language. Hello. <laughs> um, but we have a lot of friends, acquaintances, and people that we work with who are in the Writers Guild or the Actors Guild. And so it felt weird for us to continue making stuff while that was happening. Could we have obviously at the beginning of every video said like, hey, we're making videos, but there's a strike happening. Here's what's going on. Here's why it's happening. Yes, we probably could have done that route. And maybe in the next time we might go that route. But at the time it felt like we should just not support the studios at this point by promoting their work. Because what we do is promotion. Mm -hmm. Whether or not people think it, it is, it, we are promoting, like we're promoting and we're encouraging people to go watch Loki, Ahsoka, you know, Star Wars, Marvel, DC stuff. And at that point, especially because people like, like Bob Iger and David Zaslav were kind of at the forefront of the discussions, like you'd always hear their name in the news. It kind of made it clear, like, all right, if we, we should just not do anything, we should figure out what other stuff that we can do, what are the things we can watch, what are the things we can talk about that we can do in place of doing, you know, reactions to the shows, which honestly were like not even happening at that point anyway. Like some stuff had come out, some stuff had been delayed and some stuff we knew was inevitably going to come out. So we thought, well, we'll just hold off on it and we'll just wait. We still watched a lot of the shows as we, they were coming out. And then we just banked the videos for a later time until the strike was over. It was tough though. Like it was a really hard decision. And, you know, I know a lot of our fans were, were upset with us. And some of them were like, well, why are, like, why are you striking? It has nothing to do with you. And it was like, yeah, it has nothing to do with us. But at the same time, we want to make sure that our friends who are working actors and they're not, you know, the Robert Downeys, they're not the Matt Damons of the world. They, we want to make sure that those people are taken care of. Yes. At the end of the day, when the strike is over, it's not going to have, it's not going to have a total effect on us in that sort of way. Like it's not going to change our deals and what we're doing. Um, but we're hoping that, you know, by taking a stance, one, our audience is going to become a little bit more informed on what's happening and why we're, why we're, you know, striking in solidarity with, with SAG after and the WGA. So hopefully we get the wheels kind of turning for people to understand like, oh, okay, I understand why this is happening and I respect why actors are striking and I respect why people want to be in solidarity with them and why they don't want to promote the work of studios. Um, so, you know, and, and that comes with its own, you know, ups and downs as well. 
Obviously, right. we're not putting out content, so we're not really making any revenue on anything. Like our YouTube channel was making maybe like 150 to 200 dollars a month at that mm-hmm. point. <clears throat> we thankfully have like a r- very dedicated Patreon audience who was like, "Look, we're going to be here. We're going to continue supporting you guys." And you know, they were still able to experience some stuff that we were putting out. Right. Um, but yeah, it was it was tough, and it's it's continues to be tough. You know, like we did sponsored videos, and the sponsored videos did not do well. So I have to be in communication with sponsors to see, like, okay, well, let's like put the sponsorship on something else that will hopefully like do better mm-hmm. and sort of like give you some return on your investment. So yeah, it's it's been tough. Like we're still we're still recovering from it, and I don't think we'll fully recover from it until we go into next year when we start reacting to shows simultaneously during their release, like echo and stuff like that. So, you know, it was a good learning experience. And I think, you know, maybe next time we'll handle a little bit differently. Like we'll, we'll pivot it in maybe a different way, but hopefully we don't have to worry about that. Hopefully never have to worry about that again, but at least we have three years before we potentially need to worry about that again. So, right. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And like you said, now that the strikes are over, you were kind of like bouncing back a little bit. Do you have any sort of specific plans or like aspirations for the channel moving forward uh, now that you're getting back into the swing of things? Yeah. Well, honestly, like right now, and it's the second week of uh, December right now, my only um, priority is to get out everything that's been recorded and hasn't been put out yet. So Ahsoka, you know, all that sort of stuff, like the stuff that's like very time sensitive. I just want to get that stuff out. Yep. We have a cooking special. Um, so I think once those things are all wrapped up and done, then I can start looking at, okay, 2024, what the hell are we doing? Mm-hmm. Um, we do have a pretty big library of stuff that we haven't put out on YouTube yet. Squid Game, Arcane, House of the Dragon season one, all three seasons of the boys, including um, Di- Diabolical. And then when we come back into the new year, I really want to just like hit the ground running and just film as much stuff as possible. Mm -hmm. We know things like Superman and Lois, Gen V. We'll obviously finish Invincible. We did the first four episodes that have been out. And then looking at, okay, what other things can we do to try to rebuild? I don't want to say rebuild our audience because our audience is still there, but to Mm -hmm. just sort of start putting out stuff more consistently again. Last year at the end, at this time last year, Oh my God, we were putting out so much stuff, so much stuff, so many movies that we had watched, so many shows that we were watching. And obviously that's also dictated by what's actually out now. Um, But yeah, I I think that's my big thing is I, I I don't want to say I enjoyed the time off during the strike. I was stressed the whole time because I was like, when is this going to end? When is this going to end? Like, we're not really making any revenue. I'm kind of getting nervous about it at a certain point. And you have to really look at, the realities of being a creator on the internet and you have to look and say like, at what point do you just fold and just stop doing what you're doing? At what point do you pivot and just start doing something else? And at what, you know, you start thinking of all these variables. If I do this, what happens? If I do this, what happens? If I go down that route, what happens? And there's been several times, honestly, throughout the, throughout the duration of being on YouTube that I've thought like, maybe this is the last year I'm going to do this. Maybe this is the last week the last month the last (laughs) channel or whatever Uh, i mean i have told hector and augustine i I have told them that like this is my last channel as a group Mm -hmm. whatever happens after this like i'm done um but i don't i don't i don't think there's anything that would like lead to us having to make another channel Mm because it's our channel right so i'm not really worried about that but yeah i i think 2024 the big thing is getting just back into the swing of things and just pedal to the metal foot to the floor getting as much stuff out as possible and being more consistent with, with our YouTube uploads. I think that's been a tricky thing. You know, like we have outside help now uh, with editing, you know, you've helped us. You're one of the people who's helped us a lot. And because every prior to that, I was doing all the editing. It's just not possible. You cannot watch a whole season of the boys and house of the dragon (laughs) and some Marvel show and peacemaker and man, like you cannot, one person cannot edit five shows simultaneously. Right. It is literally impossible. I yeah. would never, I would die. I would die. <laughs> I would die. It's not possible. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, helping, getting getting outside help has been hugely helpful. But, you know, if we aren't making stuff and we're not making revenue, then we can't hire people. It's, I, I'm, I can't, I can't not pay people. That's just not, I, no, I can't do that. Right. Um, so my hope is that, yeah, we'll, we'll be able to do more stuff in 2024. We'll get all the stuff that we have in our inventory out on YouTube. At that point, 
the pre the new seasons of the shows that we'd watch are going to come out. So then, you know, it gives us a reason to put that stuff out. So yeah. we're going to have a pretty big inventory of stuff in 2024 to put on YouTube, whether it's House of the Dragon, The Boys, Arcane, all kinds of stuff. So I'm excited about it. It's a little scary because now you really have to budget out, okay, how much are we going to spend to edit this entire season of a show? And hopefully it makes back. Hopefully we just break even. Hopefully, it, you know, we break even to make that money back. And a lot of times you're just investing. You're just investing to hopefully build an audience and find an audience and all that sort of stuff and expand your audience and expand our Patreon. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's a, it's a journey. Every year is a journey. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Keep me in the loop on those edits. Cause uh, I had, I, like, like you said, I edited your Halloween reactions, your mm-hmm. Lord of the Rings reactions. And those were I, it's just a, such a fun time. Like honestly, yeah. uh, it's, it's work for sure, but it is also just a fun <laughs> hang with you, the three of you guys. <laughs> yeah. Again, to see like the whole thing and decide like, oh, like this joke gets to go in this way and stuff like that. Right. Um, the Halloween stuff particularly was was a blast to get through those uh, films with you. Yeah, it was a good time. We were hoping that this year we'd be able to go back and do the rest of them. But, you know, the strike was happening. So we were like, well, let's, yeah. not, let's not even bother. So maybe next right. year we'll get to doing the other eight movies that we missed. <laughs> Right. Um, and then one thing I would be remiss if I didn't bring up is your affection and advocacy for physical media, which is such a big thing you push online. Uh, and you're such a vocal, vocal proponent for yeah. the importance of collecting your favorite films and shows on physical formats when possible. Um, particularly now, uh, when it seems like there's such an alarming rate of platforms, you know, erasing content from all, basically all of existence. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's truly horrifying. Um, really quickly, as succinctly as you can uh, manage, do you think you can uh, remind us of your, just your general stance on like why that's important to you? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think a lot of people on Twitter have said it best is like people who collect physical media, they are curators in a lot of ways. They're, they're like a librarian, basically. They're, they're taking their favorite elements, they're putting them into the home and they're giving people access to them. You know, I, I try as much as I can to really encourage people to buy it because up to, as of right now, it is the best way to watch a movie. I understand the convenience of streaming. I get it. But nothing beats putting a disc into the player. And I'm lucky enough that I have, and I this has just happened in the last three, four months. I now have a projector. I now have a really big, you know, 100-inch screen that I can project onto. I have a really nice sound system. I know that everybody doesn't have that. That kind of... It matters, but it also doesn't matter. If you have a, a nice TV, it doesn't have to be the most expensive one, and you pop in a disc and you play a movie, I promise you the experience of experiencing that movie, the experience of that movie is going to be so much better than just watching it on a stream where sometimes it's pixelated, you're relying on shit internet, you know, all that sort of stuff. So I'm always going to be an advocate for for physical media because I think that it is currently the best way to experience everything. And I think if that goes away, then we do run the risk of movies going away, even on streaming platforms, because we see it all the time. Licenses moving. Westworld was on Max, on HBO Max. Mm -hmm. You know, they took it off because they want to license it out somewhere else. You can watch it on, you know, something like Tubi probably for free with ads, or you can buy all the seasons on Amazon. But why, if you can just buy the discs and you can throw it in whenever you want, no ads at the highest quality. So I'm always going to, you know, sort of be a supporter of of physical media until we get to a point where the internet speeds are to a point where I can watch an 80 megabit per second download and I don't have to use something like Kaleidoscape that costs me $20,000, you know, to get into that sort of ecosystem. I don't want to do that. So yeah, physical media all day, every day, just like vinyl. Uh, I still collect CDs even. So I'm a huge (laughs) advocate for it and I forever will be. And I love learning the process of it as well. The 4k restorations. I love knowing how they do it. So Mm -hmm. again, like visual effects, I can be a a person who can be a somewhat of a voice in that space to explain to people, well, here's why it's cool that it's a 4k restoration. Here's what they did with it. That's really cool and interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. It's very fascinating. Um, And having been a part of so many creative endeavors uh, that exist solely online and remain part of previous brands, uh, is there a, any parallel ideology you could take from your fight for physical media and apply to, say, like the preservation of like one's own work online? Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question because I think, and I know creators have gone through this because we've seen platforms enter and exit the space very fast. We've seen platforms enter the space, blow up, and then not necessarily disappear, but they're definitely not as popular as they were. You know, YouTube is the is I think one of the platforms that has consistently stayed stuck around 
and has continued to grow in popularity. And sometimes it plateaus for a little bit, but then it grows again. So I think it's an interesting cycle to pay attention to these platforms to see which ones are which ones you th- you think are going to be sustainable and which ones will sustain and which ones are going to kind of continue to break through. YouTube, I think, it is going to be one of those platforms that will always stick around unless someone takes it over and they completely implode the platform and it turns into an absolute disaster, which I think would be a, a huge disaster for Google as a company as well. Um, but aside from that, you know, I always think about preserving our our content and, you know, will it be around in 70 years? How will it exist? Where will it exist? Of course, there's I've had discussions, internal discussions with myself of like, should we like back up everything on disc and like mm-hmm. hold on to those discs? Like, should we make a Blu-ray set of our entire podcast that we'll never sell probably, but that like we can have as like an archive piece? So I think about that quite a bit. Yeah. And even something like Patreon theoretically patreon could be around forever maybe in a year it won't be where do we put all that stuff we've definitely had discussions of building a website um and i know some you know other reaction channel like blind wave they've recently done that where they built an entire website that hosts all of their material Mm -hmm. now as long as they keep that website up and running technically nothing should remove that website that website should be there until the end of time Right. As long as the internet exists, at least. Right. So we've definitely thought about something like that, some sort of an archive, online archive. But again, I think it comes down to cost. I think it comes down to what are we actually doing with that platform? Are we going to do it? Are we going to use it in the similar way like Blind Wave does, where we use Patreon as sort of like the middleman, but if people want to actually watch the stuff, they go directly to the website. Right. So we definitely thought about those sorts of things. And yeah, I mean, I think about it all the time. Like I was mentioning, you know, we record our podcast on Black Magic. Those files, those raw files out of the camera are sometimes up to 400, 500 gigabytes of storage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then I have to think about, okay, what's the realistic way of storing these things and archiving them for the long run? Recompressing those files, creating masters of those files, creating masters of the entire episode, you know, that we can archive that are good enough quality that if I lose the original footage, whatever, I'm not going to be heartbroken about it because I still have an original, I have a master that is a really great quality, you know? And I think that's something that honestly, like even studios, as much as the, you know, they annoy me and irritate me, they struggle with that too, because so much of their archive exists on film. And now they're going back and they're doing restorations and and they're reprinting, you know, their, their movies, the highest quality. So I think like everyone thinks about that, obviously when it's in a physical format, unless that physical format deteriorates or breaks, it's always going to quote unquote work, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we'll see. Um, But yeah, it's part of the reason I think why, why I am such an activist for some sort of physical media, because I Mm -hmm. feel like if you hold on to it, it's always going to be yours. And unless, and, and as long as you treat it well, it will always be there. Right. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I hope. And when it comes to, you know, how, how we're going to do stuff going forward in the future, in the far future. Yeah. Maybe we'll make a website. Maybe we'll create some sort of a, uh, a physical archive of our stuff, but yeah, that kind of remains to be seen. We haven't gotten to that point yet, but you know, drive space goes quickly sometimes. So you've <laughs> yeah. got to think about it. Yeah. It's uh yeah. Working as an editor, like the idea of drive space is like an existential dread. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. like just I, running I out. I literally have four <laughs> Samsung T sevens on my desk right now. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just swapping around drives like a madman. Right, same. <laughs> um, and yeah, to start ra- start wrapping things up here, uh, I'm gonna run through like my usual final questions, which is, um, what has been the biggest obstacle uh, for you managing your work through the various channels uh, over the years? Time, time management, and that comes that that's like not just my own time, but that's everybody's time. Making sure that you know you res- you respect everybody's time, mm-hmm. and that when they get there and they're there to do a job, you don't waste their time. You get them in, you get them out, you do the most efficient work that you can. Uh, so time management, I think, is like my big thing. And and I will say I've struggled with that for the majority of the years that we've been on YouTube. For eight years, I've really struggled with that. I, I never managed my personal time well. I didn't have – I had friendships, but I didn't have relationships because I was like I'm too busy you know, doing other stuff. Right. Um, my girlfriend is, is amazing because she has definitely – allowed me to continue doing what I'm doing, but she also helps me manage, encourages me to manage my time better. And it's been great. So I sleep like a normal person. I don't go to bed at 3 (laughs) a.m. The latest I'll go to bed, you know, on a fun night is like 12. Yeah. So 
<laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, how have you grown uh, through your work on the various channels over the years? I think I think I've um, I've learned a lot of technical stuff that most people don't care about, but <laughs> I care about it because I'm really passionate about it. And I think I've I think I've really learned to understand what makes a quality video from a technical standpoint, but also just from a standpoint of a creative standpoint, you know, and I think, again, our friendship and our camaraderie has really helped that, mm -hmm. you know, we can, we do a fun thing. We're going to do it again this year. It was the Reforgies, which was like our award show. And it's, it's a silly take on awards because to yeah. us awards are kind of silly, but it's a fun take on we make these BS categories. This year, we're letting our audience pick all the winners. <laughs> and it's just a fun way for us to celebrate the stuff that we love. And it's stuff that we watched on YouTube or it's stuff that we watched together um, throughout the years, whether it's a movie or a show or it's stuff that we watch theatrically. So I think like allowing ourselves to just be more creative and kind of like letting the – I don't know, kind of like letting the break loose a little bit and not being so like, well, it has to be perfect. It has to be a great video and it has to be, you know, this and this and this and it has to be pitch perfect visually and audibly and all that stuff. Just have fun and be creative. So I think mm -hmm. I've learned to be more creative and I just have more fun. And if something happens and there's an F up, you don't have to sweat about it. It's right. fine. Just embrace <laughs> it. Just roll with it. Make fun of it and just, you know, continue having a good time. Right. <laughs> um, and final question, beyond any financial or monetary value, what would you say is the most rewarding aspect of your time with your channels? Oh, the audience, for sure. Number one, my friendship with Augustine and Hector. They are like two of my closest friends, which I didn't think, I, I wasn't expecting that to happen, which obviously you would hope that that would be the case. Mm -hmm. But then the audience, the audience, the the people who like really know us, and who really watch our stuff, there's a, we have a lot of passive viewers. Um, and that's totally fine. You know, they maybe don't know our banter that well. Maybe they don't know our history that well. Maybe they don't understand like the frequency at which we upload our videos and that we don't care to be first. We just care that the quality is good. You know, we want our contribution to whatever our discussion is going to be to be good. Mm -hmm. If our video comes out the day, the night of a show coming out or the day after or the day after that, yeah, we might lose some views, but the the comments and the commentary that we have and discussion we have with our audience is so valuable. And everyone has been so nice to us over the last 10 years. Of course, there are those outliers on social media that they want you to die and they <laughs> threaten to come to your house and you know do terrible things to you. But that's far and few yeah. uh, in comparison to our amazing audience who now, because we have a Discord, they can communicate with each other. Like I went to Porto's in Anaheim and I went to go get some stuff for my family and a guy an employee walked by me and was like, Hey man, I watch your stuff. I love your videos. <laughs> he just whispered under his breath. And I was like, that's so cool. It's yeah. so cool that I can like go to a Porto's and someone works there and like they watch my videos on the internet. And then yeah. he tweeted at me and you know, so it's, it's so cool to run into people who are like, I love your videos like, I love when people do it. I know sometimes people are like, I saw you at a thing, but I didn't want to bother you. I was like, bother me. Come bother me. Come say hi. It's right. so cool to meet people. Um, and plus, you know, gives me, you know, extra credit points with my girlfriend. So please <laughs> make me feel cool. Uh, make me look cool. Right. Uh, but it's great. It's, it's really, really cool. I love one of the things we've talked about. We want to do more screenings. We want to host some screenings because we mm -hmm. want to get our audiences in the same room. I think it would just be so fun to spend more time with them. And I think a lot of it also is because of COVID, because of the pandemic, we didn't get to do any interactive things with our audience for so long. True. And then I went to Comic-Con and I realized, God, I miss spending time with people who like or are interested in the same stuff that I am. It's mm -hmm. just so fun to talk to um, you know, our audience members and to just get to know them on a more personal level. You know, I want to know you beyond, you know, your username on the internet. I want to know. What are you about? What do you love? What are you passionate about? What characters and what franchises do you love? Right. What's like a niche thing that I would have never guessed you really enjoy? You know, like maybe it's movies from the twenties. Like, I don't know. I would never guess that. So yeah. I love building those, those sort of like friendships and relationships with our audience. Yeah. That's a yeah fantastic answer. <laughs> the screenings is a very fun idea. I would definitely yeah. go to one of those. <laughs> yeah. It'd be fun. Yeah. Um, and to get into our, our final questionnaire of the show here, uh, just 10 questions down the line for you. Um, number one is, what is your favorite show? 
Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> um, favorite show. Great question. Oh my God. I feel so on the spot right now. I know. Well, it usually gets everyone. <laughs> yeah. I, I grew up watching Smallville. Mm-hmm. Smallville was like such appointment viewing for me for the duration of that, of that show. So I, I, and I love Superman so much that show. I feel like I was like, that show ran parallel with my life. I feel like things that happened were, would similarly happen in my life. And I was like, what is this? Is this show, am I reenacting the show or is the show reenacting me? What's happening here? So I would, I would definitely have to put Smallville up there for like a show that I've loved, you know, from the entirety of my life. If I were to pick a show from something that we watched, um, you know, God, you can, anything. I'll, I'll pick Loki season two I loved. Right. <laughs> um, and then similarly, what is your favorite film? <laughs> well i would say the i would say the film that um favorite film or film that maybe was most influential for me was a new hope mm-hmm. um that's probably like the biggest one but you know god damn i mean everyone knows i love halloween i love halloween right. so much but it changes you know like favorite movies or top five top three they change all the time but mm-hmm. you know a new hope on one side and then Halloween on the other. And it's like the perfect sort of like everything in between that is such a wide range of color um, yeah. that I love. So yeah. That's very true. <laughs> um, and then what stresses you out? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> time. Um, yeah. What stresses me out? That's a great question. Uh, well, truthfully, honestly, it is time, you know, and mm-hmm. it's feeling like the pressure of time. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. We watched this, you know, we did this trailer reaction you know, 12 hours after the trailer came out, I got to get this video up as fast as I can, but I got to spend the next 30 minutes making a thumbnail. So time, time is a big stressor in my life. And I try to manage it as best as I can. Just the fact that we're sitting here talking and we're about to, we're about to enter into 2024 (laughs) in a couple weeks. And I feel like March, 2020 just happened like 35 minutes ago. (laughs) That concept, that sort of weird, realization that it's true what they say as you get older time feels like it's moving faster right. whereas when you're 16 and you have to go through you know your sophomore year of high school it feels like an eternity mm-hmm. four years of your life f- is like a blip now yeah the yeah, fact true. that it's already gonna be 2024 is insane so i feel like i i struggle with dealing with time the 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 passage of time and time management anything revolving time i feel like is a is a little bit of a stressor in my life sometimes that makes sense which i feel that um, and what helps you relax? What helps me relax? Wine. <laughs> wine, wine is helpful. That's good. Um, but I would say a, a good movie or a good show. I love mm-hmm. to be able to just sink into the couch and put on a feel good movie. If it's Halloween, if it's chef, if it's a star Wars movie, if it's something super obscure that like Sicario, maybe like <laughs> not everybody watches. I like to just sort of escape for a couple hours yeah. And not worry about time, not worry about my phone, not worry about social media, and to just be one on one with a movie. Right. Um, I love that. Or I love truthfully spending one on one time with a friend, a group of friends, or my girlfriend. And we go to dinner, we just mm-hmm. unwind for the night, and we just, it's quality time. It's, I'm not worried about anything that's happening in the outside world. Right. That makes sense. <laughs> um, and what is a hobby or passion that you have outside of TV and film? Um, I love to travel, which I know is kind of a basic answer, um, but I really do enjoy traveling and it's fun little weekend trips, whether it's something like Palm Springs, Idle Wild, or if we can get away somewhere else, you know, or I love when I have the time and the funds, I like to go to Europe with my friends and my family. I just did that over the summer. That was an incredible time. Um, I love to just explore new cultures, new people. I love meeting new people. Um, and then my other passion outside of that, that doesn't require me to go anywhere is ice hockey. I love ice hockey. <laughs> I love going to the Kings games. When I come visit my family, I love to go to the goals games. I'm not a fan of Anaheim, but I'll go to their games <laughs> if they're playing a team that I like. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's another passion and photography too is a, is a really big one, but that's I kind cool. of lump that together a little bit with the photo with a uh, film and television because they're True. similar yeah. in some ways. Right, right. Um, and what fictional character do you relate to or just deeply care about? Superman. Yeah. Superman's my guy. And I, and I feel like part of it is because even though my, my, you know, I come from an immigrant family who Mm. had to leave their home to come to a place that was very foreign to them. Very different. The culture was different. The upbringing was very different. Um, and he, even though he's raised by parents from 
you know, America, he also has to kind of deal with being a, a, a child of two worlds in some ways, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I felt a lot of that as a kid. We have very traditional Czech traditions that we do and we have very traditional food that we eat. So when I would have people come over for birthdays or come over for holidays or whatever, you're kind of like dealing with that comfort of will they be okay with this food? Will they be okay with these these like cultural things that we do, these traditions that we do? Um, and then also, you know, when he's his alter ego, he's a little bit of like a mild mannered reclusive, not necessarily reclusive, but he's a little bit more shy. And so, and I, that's how I grew up Mm -hmm. most of the time. Like, you know, I've worn glasses since I was six years old. (laughs) And so, you know, people like to poke fun at you because of those sorts of things. So, you know, I was, and I liked the things that I liked. I always liked superheroes and I always liked things that the mainstream at that time would tell you that's not cool. People don't like those things. That's for kids. That's for, you know, this type of person, that type of a person. Um, so I don't know. There was just something about that character that I felt like there was like a little bit of a parallel with certain parts of our life um, that I was like, yeah, I vibe with this character. And also mm. it's cool that he can like fly. Yeah, <laughs> very true. Um, what is your guilty pleasure show or film? Show or film? Um, guilty pleasure film? Uh, I always bring this up. I Batman and Robin. Yeah. <laughs> People are always like poo-pooing on that movie. I'm like, you know what? That movie knew what it was doing. Yeah. That movie knew it was a toy commercial. <laughs> Joel Schumacher knew he was doing a campy 60s Adam West, Burt Ward style movie. And I kind of love it for that. Batman Forever, yeah. it kind of blends the tones of, of of both. Yeah. Of the Tim Burton stuff and the Schumacher stuff. And I'm like, Batman and Robin just went for it. They just <laughs> went for it. It's a fun time. I enjoy it. You know, yeah. I, I get why people don't like it, but I'm like... I just see past it and I'm like, it's a good time. I agree. I, I can't ha- not have a, a good laugh, you know, whenever yeah. I just uh, sit and enjoy that Come movie. <laughs> Come on. Um, what show or film gave you your favorite reaction experience with the channel? Oh, that's an excellent question. Excellent question. Oh, man. I, I think it's going to be a toss up between The Mandalorian season two and maybe WandaVision. Mm hmm. Invincible, we had a really good reaction to the first episode because we were yeah. reading the comic book. So some events happened a lot faster in the show. Yeah. But I think overall, because it was so new and it was so uncharted, the Mandalorian season two, when all of a sudden it was like Boba Fett came back and Luke Skywalker showed up and we found out who Grogu was. Ahsoka made her debut. It was all these things that were just like compiling on top of each other. Right. And then WandaVision was interesting because it was playing with the concept of the multiverse and that was all uncharted territory and it was a different style of a marvel of a marvel project you know it started right. embracing these different eras and mm-hmm. it was really playing with the mind and playing with fantasy so i i would say that those two shows i think were probably the biggest most like oh my god sort of a reaction because it was so unexpected yeah uh, but yeah a lot of stuff has been really fun to watch yeah both definitely very very good answers <laughs> for, for my <laughs> opinion as well um and what show or film do you wish you could erase from your memory and react to for the first time on camera oh good question movie i would say oh man movie wise Avengers Endgame probably in mm-hmm. most recent years Avengers Endgame yeah like when we saw that we got to see it on the Disney lot and it's it was a press screening and then you have three idiots in the row pick up the hammer pick up the hammer <laughs> say the symbol yeah so Avengers Endgame would have been a really really good one I mean yeah. truthfully any movie that comes out theatrically I would love all of those experiences to be first time reactions on our channel mm-hmm. my thing is just like with physical media, I adore the movie going experience theatrically. I right. I love it. I love it so much. And I'll always go out of my way. And thankfully, we're lucky enough that we live in Southern California that we have the option to see things. 70 millimeter, 70 millimeter IMAX, 35, you know, like we have all these options. Um, but Avengers Endgame would have been a really, really fun one. Show, Absolutely. maybe Heroes, season one. Really? That was so yeah. unique back then. True. That was so different. And it kind of took that whole genre and kind of flipped it in a way that I was not expecting. Mm-hmm. So that would be that would have been a good one to uh, to to do. Maybe we'll revisit it at some point. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the final question here: What advice would you give to your past self if you can go back in time when you first started working in the YouTube space? 
Good question. Um, the advice that I would definitely give myself is be confident, manage your time incredibly well or better, learn how to say no, and understand your value mm-hmm. um, is probably the biggest one. Because I think when we started, I because I was such a shy person and I wasn't fully confident in my abilities on camera and being able to actually like handle the workload. I said yes to a lot of things and I just agreed to a lot of things because I was just excited to do stuff. Yeah. But you have to also look at things from a, from a business perspective and you have to look at, is this going to financially be beneficial to me? Obviously not everything has to only be financially beneficial, but you do have to be realistic and look at something and go, if I invest let's say 30 hours of my life into this every week after already working a 40 to 50 to 60 hour job is the return going to be worth it in the long run. Mm -hmm. And I know that it doesn't have to always be driven financially, but the truth is no creator who makes YouTube content or stuff on a streaming service or theatrically or for television should be living check to check or making peanuts on what they're doing. Right. So sometimes when people, you know, make comments about how much we make on YouTube or how much we make on Patreon, yeah, but we're like we're doing stuff every single week and we're we're giving people things to experience. So like, yeah, I'm not upset and I don't feel guilty about making money off of, you know, ad revenue on YouTube and I don't feel bad for making Patreon content that takes me extra time to make. Yeah. for people to experience it. I used to feel bad back in the day. I used to feel guilty um about you know the idea of a patreon but now i'm like if i'm gonna put in the extra hours to give you extra material like yeah if you're willing and again it's only if you're willing if you don't want to pay for it that's totally fine you have the option to pay for it or not right um but the people who are who who can and are willing to pay for it and are cool with doing it yeah i'm happy to give them extra stuff to watch so you have to really understand your worth and you have to understand your value and you have to not sell yourself short because I think too many people do that in the industry. Mm-hmm. And I think that's how we get to a point where studios can take advantage of people because they, the studios or the the system and the industry will tell you, well, we'll just replace you. Yeah. Like, all right, well then replace me. You're not going to get the same result. You're going to get yeah. something different. You may not be happy with that, you know? So you have to really understand your value and your worth and you have to be willing to just say no when the deal's not good and walk away and it's tough very very good it's really hard yeah (laughs) you know but you got to be able to do that yeah fantastic advice all around Uh, truthfully (laughs) something that i still (laughs) had to remind myself of these days (laughs) yeah for sure uh yeah adam thank you so much for joining us today uh it was a blast honestly just hearing again your insight into it which is like my favorite aspect of what you and augustine hector provide um it's meant so much to me over the years to just get your uh expert advice (laughs) on things and uh it, it was great to have you here today yeah, thank you so much. This was so fun. I, I it was funny. Just last week, I was watching. I can't remember which episode I was watching. Might have been, might have been Greg's episode. Might have been somebody else's. Mm-hmm. But I was like, when's well, Eric gonna ask me to be on this podcast? Because this looks fun. <laughs> I just want to yeah. hang out and shoot the shit, and have fun. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. This was so fun. I was looking forward to this, um, and I had a great time. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a long time coming. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, please like, subscribe, share all that good stuff. If you find this through the Passion Fruit newsletter, please share that as well. We appreciate any new subscribers to that. And we will catch you on the next episode.